that's yeah. that's that's the goal. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna to talk today about a multi-phase program of development and research um, where we designed and implemented and studied a model of professional development that we call the problem solving model and a model of leadership preparation that we call the teacher leadership preparation model. And there are three phases I'm gonna talk about. The first phase was developing the model of, of professional development. And the second was developing and studying the model of um, teacher leadership preparation. And then the third was a partnership to use the two models in partnership with the school district to build their capacity to um, run professional development. Oh, and my slides are not moving. There we go. Um, so I was just asking Susana, um, how many people would be familiar with this model, which is the model of DZLM um, that has, and she said some of you. So I'm gonna try to situate my work in the context of this model. Um, and just very briefly for those of you who haven't seen it, and I told Susana that if there are questions about it, she gets to answer them, not me. Um, it's a model that has three levels of um, content related professional development work starting with the classroom level that is embedded in the teacher professional development level. And that in turn is developed in the facilitator professional development. Um, and each, there's a parallel for each corner of the tetrahedron as you go up the um, levels. Um, and Susanna asked me if I could try to put my work in the context of the DZLM program of research. So that's what I'll try to do. And I'll use this model as a reference. Um, so the, the first phase of the model, and this was a very interesting experience for me to do this. I went back, as you can see, um, 15 years trying to find um, PowerPoint presentations because I wanted to try to represent each phase the way, to some extent, the way we talked about it. So the first phase we called supporting the transition from arithmetic to algebraic reasoning or STAR for short, um, ran between 2003 and 2006, funded by the National Science Foundation. And here you see on the left side, um, the principal investigators, the faculty members, myself, Karen Kellner at, the, at that time, Karen Clark, Jennifer Jacobs and Jeff Frickholm. And then on the right side, three of the doctoral students who worked with us. So in this first phase, we were developing the problem solving cycle model, which is a series of interconnected workshops focused on teachers knowledge and practices. Um, three primary aspects, their mathematical knowledge for, needed for teaching, which is the knowledge of mathematics that a teacher needs that's unique to the teaching profession, not necessarily shared by um, the general public and also not by other people who use mathematics, such as engineers. It's really the knowledge specific for teaching. Um, knowledge of students' mathematical reasoning and knowledge of instructional practices to support students. And for this phase, we're really dealing with two levels of the tetrahedra model, the classroom level and the teacher professional development level. And we ask questions about each level. Um, what I'm gonna do is for each of the phases, talk very briefly about the model itself and then give you a taste of the research that we did. So this is the model. Um, I'll talk briefly about what each of these um, phases is and then I'll talk about each one in a little bit more detail. So it's a three workshop cycle that's meant to be repeated over and over again um, with a different focus each time building on, building on itself. In the first workshop, the teachers who are participating would solve a mathematical problem that they would be using in their class and develop plans to teach it. In the second um, phase, they actually teach the problem to their students and we as researchers come in and videotape. In the 
third one, the second workshop, we bring in video from their classrooms to talk about student thinking primarily. And in the third phase to talk about um, instruction. So this is a picture of the first two phases. Um, workshop one, doing for planning. On the left, you see a group of teachers who are participating. And what they're doing is they're solving a mathematical problem, exploring different solution strategies, different ways of representing the problem, and then planning how they would teach it to their students. And then in the second phase, you see one of the teachers, actually the one that's where oh, yeah. the Can base. Can get a refill, please? Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Is that a uh, Yeah. Oh, excuse me. I think Dev, Dev, could you please uh, mute yourself? That's embarrassing. Sorry, Uta. It's okay. Uta, you can do it too, yeah. Yeah, I think Uta, you can probably mute everybody. You have a lot of power. <laughs> um, so, in, so again, on the left, you see the teacher solving the problem. Then on the right, you see the teacher in the baseball cap is in the picture and he's working with his own students solving the problem. And he's going around to the different small groups to see what they're doing and to talk with them. And again, the purpose of the first workshop is for them to explore the mathematics of the problem in depth and then plan their lessons. In workshop two, they're exploring students' mathematical reasoning. So here what you see on the left is a group of students in one of the classrooms working on a problem. And actually what's happening is one of the students is explaining his solution to the other three students so that they can try to understand the way he solved the problem. What you see on the right side is workshop two where they're exploring student thinking. And what they did here was actually something very common for them. They would go back and try to work the problem the way the students had. And you see all of the writing on the whiteboard in the background. And then you see them trying to understand how one student solved the problem. And often this led to a very in-depth conversation about the nature of the mathematics. And then in workshop three, you're exploring the teacher's role. And here, what we see is um, on the left, you see a page of student work with the, with the student solution. Um, what's actually happening here is that um, the teacher is coming over to the student and asking the student to explain their thinking. Um, and the student is talking about how they solve the problem. And then what you see in the right hand side is the teachers in the workshop have now watched this video clip several times and they're analyzing the teacher's instructional practice and talking about what he was trying to do when he was questioning the students and then giving him some suggestions um, and talking about how he might do it differently. And in, in this particular case, he, um, felt like he was asking too many questions and leading the students the way he wanted her to think about it, not the way he wanted to. So that was the nature of that discussion. So that's the model that we were working with. Um, and this is um, the research program that we had. We were working with one school district. Um, we taught a summer course that was focused mainly on mathematics. Then we had two years worth of workshops in which we did three cycles of the problem solving cycle. One in a spring of the first year and then two in the second year. The first year we were working with eight middle school teachers in one school district. Um, and the second year we had 10 teachers, two of them, three, three of them were, were returning and I'm sorry, seven were returning and three of them were new. And the data that we collected, we had a lot of data. We videotaped all of the workshops. Then we videotaped the problem solving cycle lesson and a sample of non problem solving cycle lessons in each of the classrooms. 
So the problem solving lesson is the one that they were teaching um, using the problem that they had just planned. And then the non-problem solving cycle was to see if the kinds of skills that they were learning in the, in the program were influencing the way they taught other lessons. We interviewed the teachers about um, the lessons that they taught. We interviewed the teachers at the end of the project. And we also interviewed the research team about, about, the, facil about the facilitation. And we collected teachers' written reflections at the end of the workshops. I'm going to briefly talk about two of the studies that we did. One study we were looking at the nature of the discussions around video during the problem solving cycle workshop. So we're trying to get a sense of were the ways that the teachers talked about the mathematics and talked about the student thinking and their own instructional practice changing over time and what was the facilitator's role in guiding the discussions, both the mathematical discussions actually and the video discussions. Yeah. Sorry, I have to find the button where I can. Um, Hilda, could you please say something? Because I, no. You have muted if Hilda I, now. If I, um, yeah, if I again. Yeah. I if unmuted I, myself. Okay, but if I mute everybody, I mute too as you as well, because you are not host, but co-host, I think. That's but co-host should be able to unmute themselves. Try it again. Okay, I try again. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Now okay. we shouldn't be disturbed anymore. Sorry for that. <laughs> that's, that's perfectly okay. Um, we've been doing Zoom for a year and a half and we're still working on it. Yes. And I'm, I'm wondering if we're gonna be doing it again most of this year. We'll see. Um, so three questions in this particular study. The nature of the discussions around video, did they change over time? And what was the role of the facilitator? And for this study, we um, looked at, we decided to focus on whole group discussions around video. We looked at the first and the last cycle, so not the middle cycle in our research program. And because in this, in this analysis, I'm gonna talk about video. We look just at the second and third workshops in each cycle, because those are the workshops that um, used video. We're looking at features of the discussion of both the teacher's role in student thinking and changes over time. And here's a summary of the nature of the changes we saw. Overall, the conversations became longer and the facilitator had to spend less time setting up the context, setting up the video, getting people ready to watch the video um, and, and starting the conversation so that the teachers were engaged more of the time in actual conversations, analyzing the student thinking and the, and the teachers and the teachers um, instruction. The discussions of student reasoning, they started focusing more and more on the mathematics and particularly on the solution strategies that the students used, really trying to understand them and very sophisticated explorations of the mathematics, which is what you saw in that picture where their teachers were working on the problem the way the students had and all of their solutions were on the whiteboard. For discussions of the teacher's role, the teachers became more less descriptive. So rather than saying, I saw the teacher do this, this, and this, they became more analytical about 
the nature of the questions that the teachers were asking, um, how, they've, how they encourage students to share their reasoning, and then more suggestions. And what we noticed also is that the facilitators' questions changed. They became much more specific and more focused around issues of, of analysis. In the second study, um, we were focused on changes in teachers' instructional practice. And for this, we used um, one, one teacher and looked at how his instruction changed over time. And we looked at whether the changes were similar for the problem-solving cycle method lessons and the non-problem-solving cycle lessons. So this is a graph of one of the questions that we asked. We're asking whether his instructional time changed over time. And the three colors of bars, the green is that problem solving cycle lessons. The yellow is the non problem solving cycle lessons in the first year. And the red is the non problem solving cycle methods in the second year. And I want you to, to take a, a couple of minutes yourself and think about what patterns you see. And I would love for you to write down some of the answers in the chat. Now, unfortunately, when I'm in this mode, I can't see what you're writing. So do you have the ability to write in chat some of the things you're noticing? Currently, the chat is not open for participants. Oh, it's not. Okay. Well, that's too bad. Because this is more like a webinar than a, than th that's okay. So everybody just think for a couple of minutes to yourself about what you have, to have some, some oral answers. People can okay. speak. If Ute allows, people can speak. Do you, do of we have some time to allow this? I, I uh, suggest that the people that want to say something, they show up their hands and then uh, this will work, I think. Okay, Anita, I think you have to call on them because I can't see everybody. Yeah, I would do. I do. So, okay. sure. So, yeah. why don't why don't we do like maybe four or five people and what they notice? Pardon? Maybe ask four or five people who'd like to share what they're noticing. Okay. After you, after some minutes now. Yeah. Or as okay. soon as people start showing that they're ready. Okay. Okay. So if you want to explain what you see in this picture, please raise your hand. Oh no, you're on mute. Okay. Susanne. I'm not completely sure if I understand the pattern, but I found this going down of the working time and then going up of the working time very interesting. So um, more review seems to, to be a certain yeah, process of getting awareness but this does not immediately translate into more working time and does it in the end. Um, so, so what we think is happening here is for the PSC lessons, the one that they actually planned over the whole course of the project, you see more working time for students. Yeah. For the lessons that they didn't plan in the first year, not so much working time, 35%. By the second year, 
what they're learning in the problem solving cycle lessons is starting to influence their lessons, their other lessons more. So it's so, a lovely delayed transfer effect. Well, wow. delay, yeah, it, that's a good way to think about it. It takes them a while to be able uh -huh. to, to get used to what they're learning in the when they have a lot of time to plan and to have that generalized to their other lessons. Anything else? Anybody else? No, sorry, Hilda, there is no. Oh, here's one. Hi, it's me, Dylan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dylan. Yeah. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I um, think it might be that the review part shows us that they're probably more focused later on. So it's perfectly to see that it's in the first year growing that they're reviewing a lot more. I think it's the review process of their of their own process. I inter interpret it like this. I'm not sure if review really fits what I'm thinking about, but I think it's lovely to see that it's done a, a bit less, but maybe it's because of more focus. Yeah, so, so again, what we think is, Susanna, did you wanna add to that? I mean, there is the same, pattern somehow for the introduction and the other pattern for the um, delay transfer effect for the closing session. So this is most interesting. I only realized by now that in the beginning they did not do any closing for the other tasks, but then they did it for in when they started more to transfer what they learned for the problem solving cycle into the other tasks. And so it's, it's, it's actually kind of the mirror image of what happened in the reviews, right? Because in the reviews, um, initially in the problem solving so lessons, they don't do a lot of reviewing before, you know, like reviewing homework, for example. And in the non-problem solving, almost 70% of the lesson is review. So students don't have a lot of time to work and there's no, no time to wrap up a lesson. And then by, the second year of non-problem solving cycle, you're starting to see the transfer with less time in review, still not as little as in the problem solving cycle. And that allows for more work time and more time to wrap up a lesson. So in other words, we're starting to see some changes, um, but the pattern is not um, perfect, which is what we would expect. It's a, it's a complex learning curve. And now I'm realizing that I need to go on. Okay. So um, here's a quick summary of the principles of the problem solving cycle. We provide a, a common teaching experience. We try to situate it in teacher's instruction through artifacts like video. It's long term and ongoing. It's meant to be used over and over again, each time with a different problem and some different um, priorities for student thinking and instruction. And it's adapted to the participants' needs and priorities. So for example, one of the things that they were really, uh, that was important to them is practicing the kinds of questions that they asked. So for one of the cycles, we focused very closely on the questions that the teachers were asking. Okay, and now I'm gonna go on to phase two. Um, phase two, um, preparing the teacher leaders to facilitate the problem solving cycle. And this was the second project um, from 2007 to 2012. Um, again, we had another round of, of funding by the National Science Foundation. And by now you can see we're all in different places. So Jennifer is still at Colorado. Karen is now in New York and I'm in, at Stanford. So we're doing this a little bit more complicated, but when you have a long-term program of research, I think as some of you know, the people scatter. So we call this phase implementing the problem solving cycle. And we had three questions. Is the problem solving cycle model of professional development effective at improving instructional practices and student learning? 
Is it scalable? Can it be adapted to different contexts? And is it sustainable? Can it be successfully enacted by different professional development leaders without extra support of the research project? So what that means is a big part of the project was can we prepare other facilitators to facilitate the problem solving cycle? And again, we have the three tetrahedra model. This time we're looking at all three of the levels. So what's happening in the classrooms? What's happening, you know, what's happening in the teacher professional development? And then the facilitator professional development, preparing the teacher leaders. We're only in this study asking research questions about the classroom and the teacher professional development. So we're not analyzing the facilitator professional development. This is our theory of action um, that um, you have professional development for the teacher leaders. That's called um, facilitator professional development on the DZLM model. So I see a couple of people with their hands up. Uja. I think uh, that uh, it's left over. Ilan, they didn't take take uh, okay. off their hand. Okay. Okay. So um, professional development for the teacher leaders, facilitator professional development. This is the new model we're developing. Then professional development for teachers, or in the DZLM model, teacher professional development. So professional development for teacher leaders, the goal is to increase their knowledge and skills about facilitation. Professional development for teachers, the goal is to increase their knowledge and skills of mathematics instruction. That should improve the quality of their teaching and that in turn should improve student learning. And this is the new model that we're developing. So we're developing a teacher leader preparation and support model that we call the teacher leader preparation model or TLP. And in this model, um, it starts with a summer academy. And in the summer academy, the teacher leaders will work on several problems that they may wanna use during the year and they'll select two problems. And then they'll um, actually plan how they're gonna teach those problems to their students during the school year. During the first TLP session, they're preparing to conduct the first workshop that's focused on the mathematics problem. So they're thinking about how they wanna work with teachers to explore multiple solution strategies, multiple representations to really focus on the mathematics. In the second TLP, they're preparing to teach the second workshop, which is, which is the video analysis of student thinking, and in the third session, they're preparing to teach, to, to run the professional development on the third workshop. And I'll show a little bit more about each of these. So a little bit more detail. Um, in the Summer Leadership Academy, again, they would, they're preparing to select the problems they wanna use the next year and how they wanna, how they wanna um, teach them themselves to their own students. And then they're working on particularly challenging facilitation pra practices, what we found to be hardest for the um, teacher leaders to facilitate. So Uta, is your hand up now? Yes, I, I have a very tiny question. Yeah. Uh, how many um, teachers were engaged in this phase? So, in this phase, um, we had, let me think, seven teacher leaders. Seven. Um, seven teacher leaders at four schools. Okay. And we okay. had a total of about 65 teachers that they were working with. Thank and you. Just to get they, an were, idea. Yeah. they were working with, with teachers in their own schools. So some of the schools were smaller and some of the schools were larger in terms of how many teachers. Thank um, you. And the things that we had found most challenging were um, how to lead a, a video-based discussion. So in the Summer Institute, the 
the facilitators would um, maybe facilitate, maybe model facilitation, and then they would try to ro role play. And then in the teacher leadership preparation session, the first one, this is where they're pre planning, preparing to lead the first workshop. So they're looking at what, what can I do? What kinds of activities that can I use that will help teachers explore multiple solution strategies and the relationships among them? And they would also be encouraging the teachers to think about where might your students have difficulties with this problem? And because ideally they've taught the problem already to their students before they're leading this workshop, they could draw from their own experiences teaching the problem. So again, this might be um, early in a semester, so early in the whole process, and then they're gonna go ahead and, and, and lead the first workshop. And in, in teacher leadership preparation sessions two and three, they're preparing to lead video-based discussions. In the second session, it's gonna be video-based discussions around um, student thinking. And in session three, it's going to be around instructional practices. So they're doing things like identifying the goals for the workshop, selecting video from the lessons that the teachers have taught now, and planning discussions, planning guiding questions for the discussion, probing questions. And then in the second half of the set of the TLP session, they're actually gonna rehearse the discussions. So what you see in the top picture is, I'm working with two of the teacher leaders, helping them select video that they wanna use in their upcoming workshop. And what you see in the lower picture is these same two facilitators, and they're actually rehearsing the video-based discussion that they planned with a group. And in this group, you have teacher leaders from other schools, so other teacher leaders on the project. And then you have a couple of the people of the people in the research team. So you can see that I'm one of the people there. So that's what we would do in the leadership preparation sessions two and three. So Uta, if people have questions and I'm going too fast, will you um, have them raise their hand and then you can let me know? Okay, so far I do not have any raised hands here, but you are free to ask everybody who has a question, please raise your hand. I know this one is a little bit more complex. There's more layers than in the first project. Any questions? So far, obviously everything is clear, Hilda. Ah, Dilan. I, I'm just interested in one point. I um, have um, the, the question if there are some criteria or something for the facilitators, you gave them to um, identify goals or to select the video. Is it based in the first uh, time you are meeting with them for the preparation or what is the, yeah. Um, so, so that's a very good question. The first thing that they do is identify goals for their next workshop. So they've now, seen the teachers have taught the problem, they're working with teachers in their own school, and they wanna think about where did the teachers have, where did the teachers run into difficulty? So if the teachers ran into difficulty around, um, for example, one of the, the problems had proportional reasoning and several of the teachers had trouble getting students to think about multiplicative reasoning instead of additive reasoning, so they want, want to pick a video clip of students who were struggling over that and then use that video clip. So this is meant to be an adaptive program. So the selection of the video is really based on what the teacher leaders see as an important goal for the teachers in their school. Oh, perfect, thank you. And you are talking with them about these goals also, which are possible or which are the most important so they are clarified in their mind, ah, I have these and these goals which I can pick up or is it more like 
um, looking to the topic and thinking back and all the things. So I'm just wondering what are they learning about the goals with you it, as a facilitator it's, leader? So it's it's all of the above, okay. really. And and what um, what we will do is work with them as as there were enough people on our team between the research um, faculty and the graduate students that we could work with each of this of the teams and talk with the teams about okay what were your goals what do you see as important for the teachers in your school and let's pick a video clip. And what we found is that that's a big task for them. So we would actually, a lot of preparation we did beforehand was try to find a 15 minute clip from each of the, for, for each of the teacher leaders that they could then work with. So we had a sense because we were videotaping all of the lessons, we had a sense of where there were problems. So for these two, I might've said to them, okay, we picked 15 minutes um, or that, that around this issue now, let's work together to pick like a three or four minute clip. Ah, okay. Thank you. Sure. More questions? So far, there are no raised hands, Hilda. I think you could go on. Okay. So this is the project design. We worked with one school district. We had volunteer schools and participants and our intervention was working with one or two teacher leaders per school. And this goes back to your question, Uta, about how many people. Um, we did two complete cycles with a summer leadership academy in 2008, 2009. And then each cycle had two TLP PSC. Each year had two TLP PSC cycles. So two series of three. So all together, that would mean four cycles. Okay. And we were looking at issues of sustainability. So one thing that we did know that we did see is after our funding ended, the leadership of the, the district mathematics coordinator um, continued the project, adapting it to the specific goals of the school district and with all of the middle schools. And I I think I'm looking at the time, so I may just talk about one of the studies, not the second one. We'll see. So in the first study, we're looking at the impact on teachers and students. So we had three questions. What's the impact of the, of the program on participating teachers' mathematical knowledge for teaching, the impact on their instructional practices, and the impact on student achievement? Um, I think I'll just show you um, some analyses for the second one and very briefly the third one. So for impact on classroom instruction, now what we're doing is all of the videos of them teaching the lesson. Um, I'm sorry, all, all of the, yeah, all of the videos of them teaching the lesson, we're looking at the mathematical quality of instruction, both of the teacher leaders as they taught the lesson and of the teachers. And we used an instrument called the mathematical quality of instruction that was developed by Heather Hill and Deborah Ball at University of Michigan. And we focused particularly on the dimensions that were most relevant to the work we were doing. So we looked at, um, mathematical richness, which is things like the accuracy of the teacher's explanations, um, the teacher's introduction of multiple solution strategies. We looked at working with students, which was the teacher's ability to build on students' ideas. We looked at errors and imprecision, which is things like teacher's mathematical language, um, teacher's mathematical notations um, on, on, the, on the board. And, and also the, the quality, the clarity of their explanations. And we looked at student participation, the extent to which students were providing explanations, sharing their own thinking. And each of these was rated on a three point scale. 
what you see here is each of the dimensions had a number of indicators. This is just the overall pattern for each of the four dimensions. The solid lines are the teacher leaders. The dotted lines are case study teachers in each of their workshops. So we had two case study teachers that we were following more closely. And for the teacher leaders, we collected data at three points in time, the last cycle of the first year and both cycles in the second year. And for the case study teachers, just the second year. The results are complex. I'll give you a couple minutes to again, think about them. And I think maybe just because of time, I won't ask for people to, to share ideas. You won't, are you? Well, right. let's share ideas. Let's yeah, take some time to share ideas quickly. Perhaps if someone shows up uh, yeah. with hand, his or her hand, then we can use this for discussion perhaps. Yeah. And there's, there's a, there's a, I just say there's many patterns that you could think about here. Yeah, it's complex. That's it's fine. complex. Yeah. The work is complex. Susanna. What happened to the richness of mathematics in the, in the teacher leader group? This is the pattern that is most interesting for me. Um, I'm going to answer that by also comparing it to the student participation and the working with students. Mm -hmm. What we think was happening, we focused a lot on teachers building on student ideas and helping teachers to listen carefully to students and to pick up their ideas and work with them. They got better at that over time. That's the only line that goes up consistently. But the trade-off was sometimes if the student's ideas were not particularly rich, the teacher, the mathematics that the teachers focused on was not so rich. And also because the teachers were so focused on building student ideas, the student participation went a little bit down. So there's some learning going on. On the one hand, they got much better at building on student ideas. On the other hand, sometimes the mathematics suffered a little bit. Um, so those are things that it takes more than a couple of years to work on. How do you reach that balance? That's why professional development needs to be long-term. Future. I'm wondering what does working with students exactly means for I'm from science, I'm from biology, and there I can really imagine the teacher working together with the students. But in mathematics, uh, does it is it like a discussion that um, gets more time or was it, what was it? So that's a good idea. And I should back up and say, we focused in this analysis on whole group discussions. Uh, okay. So, so that's the part of the lesson that we chose to focus on. So what it really means is as students share ideas, the teacher would um, build on those ideas, maybe ask more questions about those ideas and use those ideas as a springboard for what the teacher wanted to, to talk about. There would be, if, if we had been able to focus on small groups by having video cameras on all of the groups, then working with student ideas would be um, a little bit different. We would be able to look mm -hmm. at how the, <clears throat> how the teachers actually went around to each of the small groups, which maybe is more like what you would see in science, like in a lab experiment. Yes, yeah. Thank you. And we, our resources were limited in terms of like, the technology at the time and also how many cameras we could have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, the student one is even more complex. I think I'm not gonna spend the time to talk about it. Um, 
But what I'll say about the student achievement data is we thought about it as cautiously encouraging. We, saw, we used standardized achievement tests of the state. We compared the participants to other teachers in the school district and then to the whole state. And most years we saw slight increases in student achievement compared to the other teachers. It was, it, it's complicated because of things like, we were focused on the teachers and they had different students every year. So as you look over time, the students whose tests we were looking at were different every year. And so that makes the analysis, you have to be a little bit more cautious. And also we didn't have a random sample of teachers because they were all volunteers. So when you compare it to the rest of the district or the state, <clears throat> you're comparing volunteers to people who didn't volunteer. <clears throat> so we're cautiously optimistic about <clears throat> student achievement. Um, the other thing that we saw was um, modest, <coughs> Modest improvements in the, in the teacher's mathematical knowledge for teaching, and I didn't go over that. That's even more complex to look at. Um, and, and modest improvements in instruction, and we talked about some of the ways that we saw improvements and didn't ex improvements, see improvements. The largest changes were always in the PSC lessons, which is not surprising, because those are the ones that they really concentrated on. And, the largest one was on working with students, which again is what we really focused on. So not surprising. Um, I wanna get on to the third phase. So I'm just gonna do this one really quickly. Um, in the second study, we're analyzing the professional development implementation. And here the question is, to what extent did the teachers leaders enact the problem solving cycle with integrity to the key features? Which features did they enact <coughs> particularly well and which were the most problematic? If you think about the tetrahedra, we've now left the classroom level and we're looking at the TPD level. And here we rated all of the workshops using an existing um, protocol, observation protocol. And we looked at a number of dimensions. Three of them were the culture of the workshop, um, the teacher's specialized knowledge of mathematics, which is things like, to what extent were the teacher leaders able to get teachers to think about um, multiple representations, multiple solution strategies, and um, pedagogical content knowledge, let's see, um, which would be to what extent did, did they focus on questioning strategies? Did they focus on issues like closure? Remember we saw that closure at the beginning didn't look so good in the last one. So to what extent did they help the teachers think about how you close a lesson? Um, What the place where they were actually strongest was being able to develop a very positive culture in their workshops. Um, a climate of respect and a climate of collegial reactions. I know I'm going quickly just because I wanna get to the next project. Um, here's two of the quotes. These were um, teacher leaders who worked in a pair. And what Kyla is saying is, She's reflecting in her final interview. And she's saying, in the beginning, we had our group of teachers that tended to speak up and share their ideas. We messed around with grouping a bit as we went through the year, trying to find which mix was best for getting everyone to share. So they were focused on trying to get everybody to participate. And what Jason, her co-facilitator was saying, that in this particular school, we've always been a group that doesn't like to share in a big group setting. This year we actually broke down those barriers and now we're more open about discussing things. So there was a big emphasis in our work with them and in their work about the importance of building a community of learners among the teachers. And you can see that they were fairly successful in that. Hmm. 
Now let's see, I'm trying to think which one I want to talk about. Um, so specialized content knowledge, this is the one about solution strategies and representations. Um, for each of them, solution strategies and representations, we looked at whether they were able to get ideas on the table. So were they able to um, have teachers talk about multiple representations, multiple solution strategies? And were they able to help teachers look at the affordances and constraints of the different solution strategies and representations? And also the um, relationships among them. And what we found in both instances is they were stronger at getting the ideas on the table than they were at helping teachers to explore the affordances and constraints and the relationships. And when we thought about teachers leading discussions in classrooms, it's a very similar pattern. Often teachers can help students get a lot of ideas on the table, but it's harder for the students to think about the relationships among the ideas. Or if they get a lot of solution strategies on the table, it's easy to get students to share them, harder to think about what are the advantages of each one and what's the relationship between them. So we saw the same kind of pattern with specialized content knowledge. And I think I'm, and, and um, here again is, is two of the uh, teacher leaders and talking about what they did to help teachers look at these things. During the first workshop, we look at a mathematical situation that can be solved in many different angles or ways. And we discuss how we solved it. Then we think about how the kids will approach it. We look at various possible strategies in solving it and we analyze them. And so they were, try they were focusing on these things. And Kyla says there are two main approaches we want all of you to solve the problem first using miles only. This is what she said to introduce the task. Um, and so again, you see getting the ideas on the table, but not so much looking at the relationships. And this was what she was saying to the teachers when she was introducing the task to the teachers to work on. I'm gonna skip the next one so I can talk a little bit about our last project, which is the one that we're involved in now. Um, this project is now a partnership where we're trying to build capacity within a school district to lead, the, the, to lead professional development. And to do this, we're looking at both the teacher leader professional development model to bring that into the school district and also to bring the problem solving cycle model. A lot of people on our staff, the first set is the faculty members, the second is a postdoc and then all of the doctoral students. We had a coordinator who worked on the university district partnership and then a whole set of people um, at the district team. And again, the project goals were to develop and test the large scale system level professional development aligned with the goals of the, of the school district to build capacity to conduct site-based professional development, to refine theories of teacher and leader learning. And because it's a partnership, each of the partners were bringing something to the program. They were bringing a new curriculum and a new vision of classrooms and we were bringing the two models. And I'll show you a little bit about that. Two key research questions I'll talk a little bit about today. How did, they, how did the teacher leaders preparation sessions evolve over time? And what key problem solving cycle ideas did the teacher leaders adopt and, and how did they adapt them? So here we're, so here, we're now again looking at all of three levels, but this time we're asking questions about specifically, primarily about the facilitator PD, how those sessions evolved over time, and also about the teacher PD, what ideas did they 
adopt and what ideas did they adapt to their own goals? And if you'll notice on this, this model has our learning to lead cycle that I'll talk about in a minute and our problem solving cycle, which should look familiar to you by now. It's just a fancier representation because technology got better. And for this figure, uh, thanks go out to Susanna because we were, um, we in our article that we just published about this, I had sent the article to Susanna to say, please make sure that we represented your um, model appropriately. And she sent back and said, yes, you have. And here's how I think about the models fitting together. So she's actually the one that took the two models and put them together here. And this is published in the article. So we really appreciated it. And now I'll just talk quickly about what we brought to it. Um, we had a learning to lead model. This was a new model for this phase. Um, and you also can start to see a little bit of the influence of Susanna's model. Um, in the, and I'll talk a little bit about each one of these. In the first phase, um, the, the um, so this, I should say this, this model really represents a more systematic look at what we did in each teacher leader professional development session. So in one session, we would start by modeling professional ac development activities, lifting them up from the teacher professional development into the facilitator professional development. Then we would unpack those activities. Then, then the, in the rehearsal stage, they would prepare and practice the activities, and then they would conduct the workshops. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about those. Um, so Uta, I know I'm running out of time. Do you want me to stop so we can have questions or should I keep going? I think you can keep going because in between we already had some short discussion parts. So I think it would be interesting to get the rest as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this is our learning to lead model. Um, again, I just went over it. Because this is a partnership, we brought um, one component we brought was the learning to lead model. Another was the problem solving cycle. This is again, just a new graphic of the same model that I've talked about. We also brought the teacher leader preparation model, which again is the same model that I've talked about. So we brought what we developed in phase one and phase two into phase three. What the school district brought was a new curriculum they had that was a task-based curriculum. So now instead of us bringing the problems to solve, we're using their problems from their curriculum. And their curriculum had an entry task for each unit, an entry task, which is basically um, what skills do people need to already have before they start this unit? Then an apprentice task, which is a task that is um, uh, the a first task where they're introducing some of the new concepts and skills, and it's meant to be solved as a group. The second task is an expert task, which is a more complex task, um, further developing the skills and constructs in the unit, and a milestone task, which is basically their assessment task for the unit. So again, this is the curriculum that the school district developed for middle school for each unit of mathematics. And I don't expect you to read this. They also brought their new vision of teaching and learning, what they wanted each um, classroom to look like if you were to walk into it. And there were three main dimensions. One was agency, authority, and identity. So they wanted to look at, um, did the students have opportunities to have a sense of them, their mathematical identity and a sense of their own authority in mathematics? Did they have opportunities to make arguments, to explain, to build on one another's ideas in a way that to develop their own um, willingness to engage academically um, 
and their own sense of ownership of mathematics. Um, the second was access to content, and that's the extent to which the classroom activities and opportunities um, provided equitable access to the mathematics for all students and supported all students. This was a district that had um, has a very large um, group of English learners, a number of schools that have English learners. Um, it's near the coast, we're in California, so they get a lot of immigrants. Um, and it also had um, a very diverse population, a lot of African-American students and Hispanic students. And the profile of the district, those students tended to not do as well on all of the standardized tests. So access to content was really a focus on making sure that everybody has the ability, everybody has access to learning the mathematics without lowering the complexity and the cognitive demand of the task. Um, and then assessment is formative assessment. We did not focus on that. So this is a graphic that one of our graduate students did who's much more tech savvy than any of the faculty were. And um, this is um, sort of how the project worked. So the icons in red are the, are the Stanford leadership team. The icons in purple are the district level math um, coordinator and math professional um, curriculum development. They're the people in the district who are gonna take over when we leave. And the blue are the teacher leaders. So when we prepared and planned for the teacher leadership preparation um, sessions, we all got together and planned. Then one person from Stanford and one person from the district at the beginning would lead the, the teacher leadership preparation sessions. By the end, it was just people from the district. And the people who are participating are all of the teacher leaders. And then the teacher leaders would go off to their schools and lead the professional development. So that's basically how the model worked. A difference between this and what you saw in the, in the second project is there was a very explicit, deliberate focus on preparing the district level people to sort of take over when we left. That's the idea of building district capacity. Um, again, this is the model that we used. It should hopefully look familiar. So in phase one, we have modeling a video-based discussion. And what you see here on the right is one of our graduate students, and on the left, one of the district level math coordinators, they're leading, um, they're modeling a video-based discussion, and the, the people um, who are sitting there are teacher leaders. So they're now participating in it while, while um, the facilitator educators model it. That's the idea of lifting. One of the ways that we unpacked the um, video-based discussion for the teacher leaders is a debrief session. So what you see here now is I'm in the right-hand corner and I'm debriefing the two facilitator educators. I'm asking them questions like, um, what did you hope people to see in the video? What kinds of questions did you prepare in order to um, guide the discussions about the video and backing up even more. So why did you pick this video? What were you hoping people would notice? What were you hoping people would learn? So I'm trying to debrief them so that the teacher leaders can see the kind of planning that goes into um, leading a video-based discussion and also the work that happens while you're leading it. And then again, you see um, in the third phase of rehearsal. So the person who's standing there is one of the teacher leaders from one of the schools is now rehearsing what she's just planned um, for her workshop. And the two people whose faces are looking at us 
Um, the one closest to Mandy is Janet, who's the other principal investigator. And the second one is Allison, who's the person you saw modeling the um, modeling the video based discussion. And we were asking questions like, well, I should say the questions that we asked first are these questions. How do the teacher leader preparation sessions evolve over the time over time? As the leadership was shifting from us doing it to us co-leading to the set to the school district people leading them. And what key aspects of the problem solving cycle did the teacher leaders adopt and how did they adapt them over the three years to fit the goals of, of their own schools and of the district? Those are the analyses we've now written about. We've got five or six other analyses and papers currently at various stages because again, this project is ongoing. Very quickly, what we noticed in a pretty complex um, analysis of, of all of the sessions, we saw stability of key components. So we saw that for the facilitator professional development, all throughout the project, including when the district people were doing it, they kept the modeling and they kept the debriefing and they kept the rehearsals and the planning. The way that they adapted it, the rehearsals became stronger over time. They were working with teacher leaders who had not led professional development before. So they, we continued to realize how important the rehearsals were. And also they identified challenging aspects of the workshops to really focus on. Instead of rehearsing an entire workshop, they would focus, rehearse just on key aspects of it. And one of the things that they brought to this was the idea of feedback protocols, helping the teacher leaders give feedback to the, uh, to helping the teacher leaders who are participating in the rehearsal, give feedback to the other teacher leaders in a way that would help them grow. And they, they decided that that was easier done with a specific protocol. In terms of, um, oh, that should actually say ad adoption and adaption of the problem solving, oh, yeah, the teacher leader of the teacher professional development. Um, what stayed the same, they kept on doing the math, they kept on doing video-based discussions um, but, and this is really important, they adapted them to the specific um, goals of the schools. So some of the schools that had a large proportion of English learners, they spent a lot of time doing the math to say, how can we take this task from our own curriculum and make it work for our students? How do we modify the task so it can work for English learners? That's the kind of adaptation they did to the work. And for video-based discussions, they very intentionally select selected clips and develop questions to address their own school goals. If you remember back to the second phase, we really worked with them to identify their goals and select clips. By now, they're doing this based on what we know about our own school and what kind what we need to focus on. This really quickly is a summary. Just this is all the key components, the learning to lead model, the problem solving cycle and the leadership preparation. And then what the district brought, the agency authority identity, the, the dimensions and the um, curriculum. And one parting comment, Susanna asked me to think about how the, um, work, uh, how our work um, fits with the work of DZLM. And what we think is that clearly our model fits very well into the work, into their model. We were able to use ideas like nesting, like unpacking, like lifting. 
And we think that um, bringing both models in combination when you're designing and researching facilitator professional development and developing leadership capacity could be very powerful. So to think about both to think about all of the different levels and to think about um, how to develop the workshops and adapt them using our models to work at all of these levels. So that's how we're starting to think more and more about it. And maybe that'll help you think about it. Now, let me go quickly through this. And this is just a thank you for being patient. Um, this is my contact information and Janet's, who's the other PI. And um, we have, a, we have a, a website that's about to be launched. Um, for the first two phases, there's a book that we wrote. And then for the, this current phase, the article that Susanna's model was used for, or the DZLM model was used for, um, is in this article. So I hope that wasn't too fast, especially at the end. No, I think, thank you. We have to thank you very, very much for this very rich presentation. 15 years and 60 minutes. That was a great <laughs> job, I think. And it was a challenge to put it together. Yeah. I started with 120 slides. And, oh, I yeah. did, and I did get it down to 60, so I felt okay about that. Yeah. It's a really a challenge to reduce this complexity to, to a presentation of 60 minutes, but I really enjoyed it a lot. And now I open the floor for questions because I don't get the chat started. I want everyone.